Okay. Um, you know, as Kenshi said, I, I spent a lot of time at both Baylor College of Medicine as well as the VA hospital in Houston. And because a lot of veterans, you know, have sustained emotional distress from combat trauma or upon being immigration to society, you know, I, I do see a lot of non epileptic seizures. And, and from that, uh, I kind of built an interest for, for this topic. And, and I'll share a little bit about what I learned uh, having worked with a lot of veterans uh, with non epileptic seizures. And first, uh, you know, I'm going to show video cases. You know, I'll, I'll show them in twos. One, you know, I won't tell you which one, you gotta, you gotta tell me. All right, one will be epileptic seizure, the other one is non epileptic seizure. And, and, uh, and I want to make this kind of informal, you know, feel free to chip in, you know, as, as you go through the presentation. Okay. So, so the first one, subject A, right, you know, take, take a look at it and, and see what you think. Okay, so, so the patient, uh, you know, this veteran, uh, you can see how he was asleep, but then kind of, kind of awoke, awoke spontaneously, right? You see a little bit of that mouth movements. Tell me where you are. Okay, our technician comes in and then try to talk to him. Can you tell me where you are? He, he oh, to, that's the first question. Yeah, yeah. He seemed to be, uh, you know, he seemed to be looking, making eye contact, but but he's not really all what there. What place is able this? To answer some of those questions. Yeah. What place is this? And looks to the side, not really making good eye contact. I want you to remember the color blue. And, and afterwards, once he's done, he has no recollection for the color blue or, or any any of the interactions. Can you repeat no ifs, ands, or buts? Okay, so 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 he kind of remains about this for about two What's three your name? minutes. Okay. And so so keep that in your memory. And now let's compare that uh, to this next one you know, that we're gonna show. Subject B. So, so our technician is doing the initial intake, right, when they first, when they first come to our first morning unit. And, um, and as she was talking to him, at some point, he kind of stopped moving. And then she then kind of notices it during the intake, and then come over and, and shake. And no, no response whatsoever. But it's, not, it's, it's a good example to kind of remain seated in that position. It doesn't lean forward or fall back. Kind of remains safely in that position uh, and, and stays there for uh, you know for a little bit of time. I think it was about for about ten minutes. He kind of remains in that position. All right, all right. So 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 what do we think? Uh, one is epileptic. Uh, the other one is not. Uh, should we want to venture a guess? Subject A versus subject B. B, B, B is non non epileptic, and then subject A is epileptic. Okay, actually that is correct. Uh, so that's uh, that's perfect. but you can tell. How, how similar that is, right? I mean, to uh, yeah. to most people, right? I mean, when the few of you got the answer, but I'm sure to a lot of you, they seem to be very, very similar, right? I mean, the, what's one, they're both behavior arrests, not talking, right? There's not a whole lot that seem to uh, distinguish uh, these two, all right? Now, let's go to the uh, to the next two comparisons. Now, these are going to be people who have a lot of motion, all right? The, the previous two were no motions, right? Mm -hmm. These two have a lot of motions, all right? Subject C. Okay, so, so he, he's awake already, right? You can see the eyes are open. Um, and probably, I think he's watching a movie on, on the TV. Okay, and then, then quickly, uh, the shaking kind of starts, right? Uh, very rapid, kind of to and fro. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, it definitely creates a lot of hardship. You can imagine, right, having that at home, um, uncontrollable. And then, and then there's some sort of heavier breathing by, by the end, okay, so, and then gradually uh, kind of, kind of wanes, so, so not, not too long, this one, but sometimes it can go uh, uh, quite, it can go quite, quite a long time, and, and so just keep that in mind, and then let's compare that to our subject D, all right, okay, he uh, abruptly wakes up, okay, you can, you can see that the eyes are still kind of closed, still half asleep, and then, and then sort of does Strong shaking starts, flopping movements. You can see why the bed is so, it's clo so close to the floor, right? Because he's had prior uh, instances of falling off the floor and, and having major injuries. So, so he's, it's been unfortunate he sleeps with the bed close to the floor. And, and, and these happened um, 
like several times a, a night. You know, on a bad night, you can have up to up to five, six. So it's really unfortunate. And, and he, he kind of always turns uh, counterclockwise. Interesting. He always turns. Uh, the mother mother says that uh, he always turns that kind of clockwise direction. And then, and then he goes back to sleep. And then you have no memory uh, that this happened. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right. So, uh, so, so C and D, you know, may, maybe a little harder this time, huh? Uh, what, what do we think? Uh, Grandma, D. Which one is epileptic? Which one? C is epileptic. Yeah. So C is epileptic. Yeah. And then D is no. non epileptic. Is that kind of what they're yeah. thinking? Oh, they both be epileptic, right? Yeah, because okay. they're both doing all those Wait, all great those movements. An uncontrollable all those grandma seizures. That, that's right, that's right. So, so it turns out that, that D is epileptic. Wow. So, surprise, right? Wow. Surprise, wow. surprise. And, and, uh, and C is non-epileptic. What? Okay? So, wow. so it's just wow. going to show you how, uh, how this can be rather difficult, mm -hmm. right? Most people actually gets, no it, gets it wrong. That's that right. Makes no it makes no sense, you know, when you yeah. when you're looking you at it, right? At and that, that's why um, that's why doctors that's why you know doctors need to do very careful workup. And, and and part of this conflict or part of this trouble finding the right diagnosis is, is gonna be what I'm gonna emphasize a lot about uh, with the, with the, some of this talk. All right. Okay. Okay, so so what are uh, non epileptic seizures, right? They they are sudden, right? They're time limited shaking that can that contribute to weakness, numbness, warmth memory lapses uh, or unconsciousness, just like the seizure, uh, epileptic seizure, all right, except that these events are not due to actual electrical storm in the brain, all right, they're coming from somewhere else, all right, even though they look just almost, a lot of them look just like a seizure, but they're not from actual brain storms inside the head. Sorry, so on an EEG, if they have a non-epileptic, nothing is going to show on the screen, is that correct? That, that's right. Well, nothing okay. that nothing that is no bloody form. Yeah, nothing that is dangerously frying the brain. Okay. 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 And and uh, you know there are two main categories for non-epileptic seizure. Right? There's one that we call physiologic non-epileptic seizures. They make up a small percentage, maybe just one out of every ten. All right. So we're not we're not as worried about this one. They, they come from conditions, organic conditions. that are kind of they're well known to give you to give you an episodic symptom like. Like hypoglycemia, right? If my sugar drops, I have episodic symptoms, right? Uh, or if I have low blood pressure, I may feel a little warm, a little woozy, and then it gets better as my blood pressure comes up. But then, the, but then there's the other category called the psychogenic non-epileptic seizure. Now this makes up the majority, 90 percent, of the non-epileptic seizure, and, and that will be the focus of, uh, of my discussion today. All right, so this category of non-epileptic, psychogenic non-epileptic seizure. All right, so 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 what are how are I mean how are they where do they come from? I mean I think your question kind of alludes to that, right? Uh, where do they come from compared to epileptic seizure? Well, I think a good way for me to think about the brain is compared to a computer, right? I mean, a computer can become not working well if there's a hardware problem, right? And, and what is what are hardware problems? A problem with the with the, the way the monitor is, how the circuits are, uh, or or if the if battery is burnt. That, that those are hardware problems, and, and that's where epileptic seizure come from. They're from hardware problems. Like if, if I have a tumor in the brain or a stroke, then then that that scar may then lead to short circuiting of my brain and cause a seizure. All right. For psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, I like to think of it as a more of a software problem. Right? How how the brain are instruction are taught to talk to each other. And um, and you know you know we have emotion centers in our brain, we have motor center in our brain, right? But somehow the emotion center has a very you know talks has a very high connection or strong connection with the motor center, such that when you become emotionally distressed, you easily then can have motor symptom because of that kind of kind of abnormal sensitivity between the two centers, all right? How how they talk to each other. There's a, there's a there's, some, there's somehow an abnormally easy communication that, that they tend to, that, that's, that's there. And, and, and why, why does that occur? You know, uh, it's, it's, been, it's well known that traumatic experiences, like from combat, right, or, or uh, car accidents where you nearly died, you know, that, that kind of a trauma can, 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 can lead to, over time, uh, cause a dysfunction in, in how your brain function, in how your brain talk to each other, all right? Sometimes uh, uh, abnormal social development, can also be another reason why, why that miscommunication uh, can occur. 
I mean, people, kids, right? We all, most of you have kids. Uh, you know, they, you know, they, the normal development is that they, they grow up, they graduate high school, right? They go to college, become independent, get a job afterwards, and then eventually become married, right? But if somehow that normal development is, is disturbed by, from either major medical illnesses like leukemia, childhood leukemia, or from having to go between foster homes after one after another, right? Somehow that kind of maldevelopment uh, can, can lead to you know, a, a failure to launch, right? not, not the proper development uh, that, that people normally go through. And, and that's, that kind of experience is another main reason uh, uh, that, that these kind of misconnections can occur in the brain. All right, so, so they're both very real, right? Just because it's psychogenic, you know, doesn't mean it's not any less real than, than, a, than a hardware problem, right? A software problem is not any less real than a hardware problem. And, and in fact, uh, there are a lot of uh, biological, you know, people, you know, there's debate between what is psychological. Some people feel like it's a different in identity compared to a biological, but, but there are increasing evidence that, bio, just, that biology, that psychology is just as much biology, and, and, they, and they're, they're kind of intermixed entities, right? For example, you know, people with brain injuries, you know, uh, are, uh, it's, it's a well-known, you know, it's a well-known susceptible. It causes a well-known susceptibility uh, to cause to having uh, to be having psychogenic seizures, and then you know we we all we all know about uh, you know uh, emotional stressors from you know arguing with uh, you know having a bill to pay uh, or, or interpersonal stressors, but but let's not forget how having um, medical illnesses how stressful that can be, right? I mean every time you go through a surgery like cardiac surgery, you, your your heart literally stop, right? Before they you know they stop it before they turn it on again. And so you're really dead on the table, and then you come back again. I mean, to go through that experience is, is pretty traumatic, right? Each, every cardiac surgery, it's like you die again, and, and, and you die, and then you wake up. So, uh, so, so these are, you know, we forget how, how traumatic uh, medical surgeries and medical illnesses uh, are, all right? And, and, then, and then there are some genes that can actually contribute uh, to psychogenic seizures, right? You know, there are studies that says that they tend to run into the family, you know, uh, among among the parents, uh, even siblings, uh, there, there's a, a tendency to do that. All right. So, so, um, so for sure, you know, it is not the patient's fault. You know, we have to realize that there are a lot of factors that are contributing here. All right. Okay. And so, how common are they? Psychogenic seizure. So, PNES uh, stands for psychogenic seizure. Okay. So, I'm going to refer to it uh, as PNES uh, going forward. So, so in the civilian population, uh, you know, we we tend to think. Um, that probably about two, twenty to thirty percent of uh, of all the patients that come to the come to the unit ends up having uh, PNES. However, within the VA, right, within our marking unit at the VA, uh, we find uh, a little higher. We find up to almost two thirds. Uh, uh, Sixty-five percent of those that are older than sixty, uh, and sixty percent of those that are less than fifty-nine years old. And and, and why do we think that is? It's probably related to the higher instances of, of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and head traumas uh, among veterans uh, that are coming back. All right. Somehow those comorbidities uh, lead to uh, lead to a higher higher PNES frequency. All right, and then uh, you know for sure you know it is a, a very serious problem. All right, PNES. You know you know just just having the right diagnosis you know is very difficult. And as you, as we can see from the examples which are earlier, right. Um, a lot of a lot of times they are misdiagnosed uh, as seizures, as epileptic seizures, and therefore they're not properly treated, right? And, and so patients come to the ER a lot because they're not properly treated, and and when you come to the ER, what happens if you if your seizure is not stopped? You know, you know if you're not treated properly and the seizure is not stopped, what happens in the ER? You can die. You, you can either die or you become intubated, right? Because they're they're so afraid that your your brain is being fried that they want to calm your brain down, right, and you really calm it down, and it calm it so much that you need an airway protection, wow. you become intubated, all right, you, you need induced coma, and, uh, and, and that is, uh, you know, that is really hard on the body, and, and often unnecessary, if it's, if it's PNES, all right, so we definitely want to avoid that, and, and sometimes you, uh, you know, if people don't know what's going on, you know, they do, they do all these tests, right, and some of the tests are, are pretty, you know, pretty traumatic uh, and, and, and pretty uh, dangerous, like spinal taps, right? I mean, have you guys, you know, you know what that is, spinal tap? Maybe some of you have had it done, okay? I mean, these are, you know, you have this little non-lenal that, that goes through your, 
kind of the lower, lower part of your back, and they, they kind of go in and sample some, some spinal fluid, all right? And, and that's, um, you know, that's a, it's, not, it's not a dangerous, dangerous, but it's not a pleasant procedure. And, you know, and, and, um, and for these patients, PNNS, they sometimes get it unnecessarily. And of course, medications, right? I mean, the, you, these are, you know, you know, to me, medicines are, are toxins with beneficial side effects, right? And and uh, and you get you get these uh, seizures that are meant for brainstorms, but the patients with PNS don't have brainstorms, and so they're not properly treated, and they don't need uh, uh, these medications. And and what's even worse is that sometimes uh, the, the proper treatment, which are are more psychological intervention, they're they're kind of delayed. Because the doctors are so focused on, on using medication, anti epileptic medication, uh, to treat, right? And, and that often delay, you know, that, that delay in getting the proper treatment uh, is another, uh, another major, major problem. And, and the longer you go and diagnose, the worse the prognosis. You know, we, we know that uh, for, for fact uh, after uh, many, many studies have shown that. Okay. All right, and so, so therefore, getting that, that correct diagnosis early, promptly, you know, is, is very critical. And how do we get the right diagnosis? You know, the doctors uh, go through, first they go through a very detailed uh, uh, medical history. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're not just more than our seizures, you know. We are, you know, our overall psychosocial history, you know, it makes, up, uh, makes us whole as a, as a, as a person. And, and you have to, we have to understand uh, the patient's entire social history, the entire makeup, other than just the seizures. And you know we have to do a careful examination. We do brain imaging and blood tests, and then uh, and then we do uh, this video EEG monitoring. And, and I'll show you more about that uh, a little later. Uh, and then uh, and then we'll do uh, a psychometric testing. These are paper and pencil tests, right? That you answer uh, you know, on, on on a sheet of paper, and somehow the scores on these instruments uh, tell you um, you know your, your propensity towards a certain behavior or certain or certain personality. Okay. All right. So, so video EEG, right? Um, anybody uh, know what that is? Have you guys, you guys kind of know that, right? Yeah. These are um, these are what we call what we think of as a gold standard for the proper diagnosis of epilepsy versus uh, PNES, right? These are you know you, you go in for a whole week, right? You come in on a Monday usually, right? They put you on on, on EEG wires, and then they, they keep you through a few days, some point, usually about a week or so. And then the, they, they may take your medicine, medicine off, or, or they may give you some lights, or they, they may keep you sleep deprived, so that, uh, that there's a greater chance of you having an actual event uh, uh, while you're being monitored. All right, and, and, when, and, and by seeing an event uh, while being monitored, right, like like this gentleman here, then they're able to kind of see what the brain waves are, right, and and how the video looks. Okay, and, and by that, by having those information together, you know that that really allows us to have a a more confident, in fact, very confident diagnosis a lot of time. All right, and and not and not just the EEG, but but this video, this video part is actually a very important part of it too. Because by based on our experience, by seeing how how the shaking looks like, you know that that in itself uh, can help us rule in or rule out psychogenic <laughs> seizures. All right, and um, and and here are some of the decision features that, that we often use and probably what you use too when you were looking at the videos earlier, right? So, so, so let, me, uh, you know, me, you know, let me see if this is kind of what, what you were kind of, kind of were, were kind of thinking of when you were looking at those, those uh, few uh, videos earlier, okay? So, uh, so epileptic seizures uh, and uh, versus psychogenic in terms of stereotypy, you know, how, how they look alike, you know, each time, do they look very similar or are they very different, right? That's what stereotypy means. What, what do you think, you know, uh, in terms of stereotypy? Which one will have it more and which one wouldn't? You think psychogenic seizures will have more stereotypy, s similarity each time, or epileptic seizure? Epileptic seizure. Epileptic seizure, right, that's right. So, so yeah, usually, they usually kind of look the same every time, mm -hmm. almost identical. Versus uh, psychogenic seizures, yeah, they can be a little more variability. Sometimes longer, sometimes short. Okay. Movements, all right. Movements, uh, you know, you know, epileptic seizure goes through a, a fairly organized movements from our experience, right? The people often go through what we call a tonic, clonic uh, uh, convulsion, where where a tonic phase often occurs right before the clonic shaking, all right, and not the other way around. It's kind of, it's kind of organized that way, versus uh, versus you don't get that kind of organization uh, 
uh, with psychogenic seizures. Often they're more irregular kind of asynchronous thrashing. All right. So there's often a more of an organized gradual progression. Often the head may turn and then the shaking start. All right. So it's, it's predictable and more organized uh, with epileptic seizure. All right. Uh, event tempo. Uh, you know, often the epileptic seizure will have a beginning, will peak, and then have an end. All right. Uh, versus a psychogenic seizure may may have a beginning and an end, but then but then it kind of starts up, kind of comes up again, and then wanes, and then wanes, and then starts again. All right. It doesn't it uh, usually kind of wax and wean uh, throughout uh, throughout an event, and and overall uh, they tend to be a little longer. Right. Psychogenic seizures tend to be a little longer, whereas most epileptic seizures are usually less than two minutes or so. And, and, and that's, you know, and, and that's where the problem is, right? They're, the fact that they're so long sometimes makes the doctors really, really worried, right? Especially if they're not sure what the diagnosis is. And, and, that's, how, and that's why they get intubated in the ER, right? That's why they get all these medicines, um, sometimes uh, much more, sometimes because they become very toxic on all these medications that are not uh, meant for psychogenic seizures. And, um, and, and there's a lot of uh, hardships and disability that, that comes from, from that. All right, and interactions, um, comparing epileptic seizure versus psychogenic, uh, uh, what, what do you think, how to, you know, regarding the patient's ability to interact, uh, what do you think about that? Does, is one gonna have more than the other? Uh, just in general, you know, not, definitely nothing's universal, right, but just in general. Um, <laughs> uh, about, yeah, yeah, but, but in general, uh, a psychogenic seizure, there, there, there is in general a little bit more interaction, uh, a little bit more memory um, and, and perception and during a seizure, during the, a psychogenic seizure versus epileptic seizure, uh, usually you know, very little or none. All right. And then an inducible, meaning are there certain things that can trigger it? Oh, yeah. Right? Are there certain things that can trigger it? In general, you know, epileptic seizures uh, have, have no no known. I mean, some do, but in general, most epileptic seizures have, have no obvious trigger. They occur spontaneously out of the blue. Uh, versus psychogenic seizures are often occurring in some sort of uh, some sort of a, a setting. Uh, you know, could it be could it be interpersonal conflict? Or could it be intrapersonal conflict? All right. Could it be uh, the, the stress related to an exam that they're taking? Often uh, uh, there are situations that tend to trigger psychogenic seizure, uh, uh, and, and, and these triggers are kind of less so uh, in epilepsy. All right, and, and so so you know I emphasize how how just seeing how the seizure looks like can be very helpful uh, in, in the trained eye, especially you know in the doctors who are familiar with psychogenic seizure, and, and that's why uh, you know we we want to we really like to advertise how how the video is really important, and and, and you know everybody as a smartphone nowadays, right? I mean, you know, let me, let me kind of sample this room. How many people here doesn't have a smartphone, right? Right? I mean, if it was 10 years ago, I mean, I may see maybe half the room, right? But, but now, nowadays, everybody has a, cell phone, a smartphone, and in fact, the videos are, are such great quality now that, uh, that if you film, right, if you, get, if you have a chance to film it, uh, and then you can either email it to the doctor or bring it to your clinic, right? And then we can take a look at it, and based on our experience, right, from, from knowing these distinctive features, we may have a, have a better say sense. Do you should just your selfies? <laughs> usually, usually it would have to be a family member. I know, member, I right? know. Somebody who's with you. Yeah, and, and, then, and then when I say record, I, uh, you know, I, I want to record at the beginning as much as possible. Right, right? Right. I, know, I know people are kind of panicky, right? It's always hard to get that beginning. Yeah. But record as much at the beginning as possible, and then recall all the way through. All the way through uh, until you get the peak, and then the end, and then to, and then record as many as possible, right? Not just one, but uh, you know, but, but a few, right? Because remember stereotypy, right? right? That was one of the one of the important feature here, right? Whether they look kind of the same every time, or whether there is some variability, that that is going to be important uh, for the doctors uh, to, to decide. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, can you go back to the last slide for a second? This one. Yeah, where you're talking about. Um, Inducing or inducibility? Yes. Um, if it, if you're talking about the difference of the two, <clears throat> yes, I know that everyone is completely different, so right. you can't right. really stereotype. Right. But for the difference there, is that normally a, a sign of the split? 
Like, is it more of an inclination if it is a split? I mean, I know that right, some people... Right. Well, well, for the doctors, you know, we never want to use one criteria alone and say, right. okay, well, you meet that criteria, then, then you're, you're that diagnosis. Right. Like, we want to use all the evidence we can. Right. And, and by having all that evidence together, then, you know, we, we can then decide yes or no, you know, which one you have. Okay. So, so that's, so, so indisputably, it's just one evidence, all right? Because I've never heard that before. Right, never right. Never it's just one part of the evidence, and, and there's no one single evidence that, that we, you know, we, it's sort of more of a gestalt, and, and, and it's an aggregation right. of, of evidences. And, and, and yeah, and then there, unfortunately, yeah, there are some, you know, uh, epilepsy that are inducible, right? I mean, we all know about playing video games, right, and how some epilepsy, especially those in, ch in child, in, a, in children, in a uh, kind of a young child, uh, are, are photosensitive. All right, so there are always exceptions. <coughs> Doctor. Yes. I have a couple of questions before we move on. Uh, the post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. I noticed that those were veterans between the age of 62 and 65. So I just wanted to make sure. Mm -hmm. What if you have a veteran that is much younger? Mm -hmm. Will he not display the symptoms until he's older? Oh, okay. I want to make sure I understand. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, you know that uh, that that you know that that slide that you're looking at is people who are less than a certain age, right? So that's inclusive. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. yeah, it's people who are less than 59, right? Okay. So so yeah, 20 year olds, 30 year olds who are just coming back from from Iraq, Afghanistan, right? They, they right. fall in that. And, and, and among, among those that come to our unit, about 62% of them ends up having Are the younger uh, veterans, yeah. the 20, 30 year olds. Right, so, right. so that's not genetic, the ones that are um, <coughs> psych, psycho... Psychogenic. Genic, they're not genetic. They're, they're some, some may, right? right? Some, some may. You know, uh, there, there, are, there are some studies that have shown that there are some, you know, that, that they do run the family in some cases. So we don't want to, you know, so, so, uh, so they have their parents playing, you know, in parts because of the genes. So the veterans that's treated for post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, yes. how will we determine if they're not uh, showing symptoms of a seizure? Mm -hmm. How will we determine if they actually have a seizure? Have a seizure, right. So, so, uh, so, so that's why, uh, you know, if the seizures are fairly frequent, all right, they can come to our unit, right, our epidemiological unit, where they come in, and, and we have that at our VA here, you know, okay. down the street. You know, we have four beds, right, they come in on a Monday, they get wires put on their head, and then we just kind of watch and wait, kind of have them stay throughout the week. Usually it's five days, all right, and then hopefully, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll stress them a little bit, we'll, we'll keep them state deprived, you know, we may try some flashing lights, all right. Okay. And then, then if they have one of their events, we can, we can really study it. Right? We study not the EEG only, but the video part. The video part is quite important. And if your uh, if if your friend or somebody you know have 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 seizures, you know, you a family member can film it too. All right, because by by seeing that, you know that you know you know having having that that video, having that image, right, that speak a thousand words. You know, we we don't have to. We don't have to talk to him so much anymore. You know, we don't have to talk to him, have him describe it in words, and imagine what the attacks are like. Well, you know, we actually can see it on the video, and that you know, that's very helpful. Okay, and then I want to make sure I wrote this down correctly. Okay. Uh, if they're having uh, EEG, there would be no disturbance in the brain waves. That, that's, right. That's, that's, that's right. That's right. That's right. There are no there are no brain storms. You know, these okay. are, there are no terrible brain storms inside the head, and that's really good. So does that mean they're not conscious, or they, or they are conscious? They're, uh, they're, they're, uh, they could be both, okay? They could, they could be unconscious or conscious. They could still be both. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It seemed like that if there were enough people like that, then there'd be accidents all over the place. People mm -hmm. falling down stairs and running into cars and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. People with psychogenic seizures still have injuries. You know, that's, that's the unfortunate part. They have no control over these. Right, right. And if they don't know it, so, and they don't know it. what's happening, mm -hmm. then they get out there and put themselves mm -hmm. in a dangerous spot. That's right. That, that's why it is such a oh, difficult God. problem. You know, I mean, uh, yeah. that's why uh, it's, uh, it's something that, that we, can't, uh, we can't ignore. We cannot deny yeah, yeah, that yeah. it is not a problem. Mm -hmm. It is you know, a very real problem. Mm -hmm. So I just have just one more question. Oh, go ahead. If there's no brainstorm mm -hmm. on the EEG, I was wondering, how is it even possible for the neurologist mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. to diagnose the patient mm -hmm. incorrectly okay. if there's no series of brain that, That's right, based on our experience, seeing thousands of patients with seizures, right? After many, many years, we have sort of an aggregate evidence of if a patient have this kind of shaking, right, it's more likely PNES. If, if they're this type of shaking, it's more likely PNES. It's just based on our experience of seeing thousands of patients. So can a person have a combination of both? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. That, that's true. Small, a small portion, not a lot, but a small portion, maybe 10 to 10 percent, can have both epilepsy and an epileptic seizure. All right, all right. And, 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 and to your point, there are also psychometric testing, you know, testing paper and pencil testing that, you know, we know from experience that a patient with psychogenic seizure will tend to score a certain pattern. You know, on the personality testing or, or on on the, on certain the tendency uh, in their thinking uh, or their behavior, we, we do we can see that on on their, on their testing as well. All right. Along those lines, I was going to ask. We know my daughter has epilepsy. Okay. Hers are non-convulsive. They've been called on the EEG. Okay. So I was curious if she can also have the other type as well because. I feel like we see sometimes what, actually I wrote on the epilepsy website okay. one time, okay. um, and they call them um, emotional seizures, seizures right. and we feel like we see those at school a lot, sometimes, okay. um, but things like that haven't been picked up on the video EEG, just her other type, so I was, I was always curious, can you have both, and she's non-convulsive during her big right. seizures, so right. she's she on stairs and become confused. Right, and she has status epilepticus too, so hers just Going yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's a good thought. And you know, like I mentioned, up to 10 to 15 percent of, of, of all patients with, with psychogenic seizure will also have post mm -hmm. epilepsy. All right. And she doesn't necessarily and have to do the jerking either with right. the psychogenic, so right. she doesn't right. with the other that might just be her pattern. And usually, these patients with, <coughs> with both <coughs> diagnoses, right, mm -hmm. they usually start out with, with the epileptic seizure first, mm -hmm. right. And then over time, you know, as their as they have the seizure, it's going to disrupt their lifestyle, mm -hmm. right? They, you know, they're they're bullied at school because of their seizures, mm -hmm. or or somehow, um, you know, they're not able to make the grades, mm -hmm. right? And because of the stress from that, the emotional stress from from that disturbed lifestyle, then the psychogenic seizure evolves. So so that's a, something to, to think about, and, and it's a good thought that you have. It, it can occur. Doctor, I'm sorry, I'm still a bit oh, okay. confused. Okay. If on the EEG, it's, like, it's showing that there's no brainstorm. Yes. I still don't understand how mm -hmm. a, a doctor that's not in your profession, Question. just a neurologist, right, would not be able to determine it's not a it's it's a non. That's right. It's epilepsy. And, and that's, I, I that's don't very, understand how. I mean, that's that's, that's why it, it is very difficult, right? Just looking at the without the EEG, right? Without the pathologies evaluation, and just looking at the seizures alone, right? Looking at those two videos without the EEG, right? It can be very hard, and and and, and a lot of people are are misdiagnosed. That that's why if there's a if there's a, a opportunity to get video EEG, you know, we should always try try to get it. All right. Now now sometimes the seizure could be once a month or, or once every few months, right? And, and unfortunately, for that one week admission, we won't be able to sort of capture it so practically, right? Mm -hmm. In that case, uh, a home video, if you could, film it and then, uh, and then show it to the doctors. It's not perfect, but at least it kind of helps the, uh, the neurologist. And, and, then to, and if the neurologist is not sure, then, then refer uh, to an epileptologist. Okay. And, and, and we can then, then look at that video and, and, and have, a, have a more confident but the test is not that a person that actually yeah. have epilepsy, the seizures are going to occur more often Which, than not. The chances are that a person that has epilepsy, yeah. the seizures are going to occur more often than a person that has, has done none. Okay, it's, it's probably variable. I don't okay. think one has any more than other. Okay, kind of person, case by case. Okay. All right. Is this new terminology, or has this terminology been around for 50 years, or so? It's, it's been around some times now. I mean, yeah. Say 50 years ago, would they have had the same yeah. terminology? Yeah. And in, same the past, in the past, people have used the term, you know, like, like pseudo-seizure, which, which I really don't agree with, right? Mm -hmm. Because pseudo-seizure okay. has a 
So kind of it has a sort of a fakeness term to it, right? right. Pseudo is something that is not real. But what grand mall versus petit mall? Is yeah, that, yeah. Those is apply. That? Those apply more to epileptic seizures. <coughs> epilepsy. Epileptic seizures. Okay. Yeah. But uh, but yeah. But now nowadays uh, we, we, we we do not like to term pseudo seizure. We okay. like to term right. non epileptic Thank seizure Thank because because uh, we know these are very real. We know very real. we know okay. these. Uh, we know okay. patients have no control over these. All right. All right. Okay, and, um, and and as I was, as I kind of mentioned earlier, uh, there they are uh, you know these paper and, and pencil tests where uh, you know once you once you kind of score it, uh, the doctors are able to kind of get a better sense of of who you are, how you think, or how you feel. Um, and and patients with psychogenic seizures uh, have a, a little higher score on some of these tests. All right, and overall. Overall, uh, these these testing uh, can also these paper testing uh, can also uh, will, will, will tell us that uh, that, that often uh, there are pre-existing depression and anxiety uh, in a patient. Uh, there may be a certain personality trait that, that a patient have that, that are uncovered on these tests. Often, uh, what, what we see is that uh, is that the personality is, is, is that of a person who is sort of not not as flexible, uh, who sort of kind of have to do a certain things a certain way only and can do uh, can do others. So, all right. And, and then, the, um, and then, chronic illnesses you know, are often the, we we often uncover that a patient has gone through a lot you know, from from these testing. It, it kind of patients report having gone through a lot of uh, prior uh, medical illnesses and surgeries. So, so having having that traumatic experience from all of these <coughs> illness and surgery that uh, also contributes to psychogenic seizures. Um, question. Yeah. For, for, for patients with people in general, with the history of drug or alcohol. Do you see a relation between your um, you know, the substance abuse yeah, yes. with either one of the... the that, that's right, that's right. And, and not so much from the substance itself, from the toxicity of substance, but before, before from the disruption in their lifestyle because okay. of that. Okay. Uh, because often they become bankrupt, right? They call the house going to foreclosure mm -hmm. because of the substance abuse. Okay. They, uh, their, their, domestic, their domestic issues become disarrayed. And in and, and that setting, you know, in that chaos, when the psychogenic seizure the result of their substance use problem, not the actual right, thing. right, right, and um, and and to me, you know, psychogenic seizure never doesn't evolve just one overnight, right? There's no one single thing that happened and bam, you have it the next day. In fact, it, it's several factors that kind of add up over time, and eventually, the last the one one last thing that breaks a camel's back, one last straw that breaks a camel's back, and then the pseudo seizure occurs. Example of, of one veteran, you know, that I've seen recently you know, would be that, you know, previously in Iraq, right? He uh, he was in an, he was a victim of an AED IED blast, right? So he has some shrapnel that, you know, got onto his back, uh, and then he had a close head injury, and 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 so because of that, he has a chronic head injury, it makes him kind of remember not as well, and then he has chronic back pain. And because of that, uh, you know, because of these chronic illnesses, he's not, he's not able to perform quite as well, right? Coming back to work uh, in, in the civilian population, and, and so he has a lot of job and financial pressures. And, and because of not able to make enough, you know, not able to make his rent, you know, uh, there's more conflict at home because of that, right? Because uh, you know, we all know how, how stressful having not enough, we know how stressful financial uh, conflicts can be. And then, then because of the arguments he has with his wife, sometime after an argument, his, his back really acts up, right? It really makes back, back pain worse. And, and then and to, to solve that back pain, right, the doctors never want to give him, you know, doesn't treat it properly or, or isn't giving enough medication. Uh, he, he then kind of go uh, and, and, and abuses alcohol because that kind of numbs up all the pain. And then lastly, you know, last month, right, uh, his, uh, one of his brother uh, uh, died uh, unexpectedly. And, and that's the last straw, which then, Gonna lead to uh, lead to psychogenic seizure, right? So, so, uh, so it's never one single thing, all right. It's always an aggregate of, of many, many things uh, that add together uh, and, and lead to psychogenic seizure, all right. So, 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 how do we uh, how do we go about uh, you know a, a kind of a, a, how do we approach a, a patient with psychogenic seizure? I, th I think the first part is, is is understanding, learning about it. Uh, to to me, you know, a lot of patients tell me that 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 you know, not knowing, right, the anxiety of not knowing what's going on, that's like the worst deal, right? When they're having a seizure and they, they don't know what's causing it, right? 
there's always thought that am I going to die from this? Is it frying my brain or frying my heart? Am I going to wake up? Right? And, and, and just that fear alone then add to the vicious cycle of, of the stress. And, 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 then the, and, then, and then that actually becomes almost like a self fulfilling prophecy when you have that, that warning and then just a fear of that actually trigger an actual seizure. Versus if you had the warning and then you just kind of calm yourself down, then maybe you would not have had it. All right? so, so the anxiety of not knowing and not understanding what you have, I think that's the first obstacle. And, and so that's the first part that the doctors uh, you know, really want to tackle. All right? And so, so part one is, 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 um, is what I call the good news part. Okay? You know, we we want to emphasize with the patient that there are no brainstorm, no lightning, no tornado in the, in the head. And, there, and the chance of any permanent brain damage is very, very slim. If basically not. All right? And, and that there is not a danger to the heart. I mean, we, all, we have these one lead, you know, on the, one, one lead EKG that we often have. And, and that uh, you know that will show us whether there's any irregular heart rhythms or, or mini heart attacks, and and for PNES uh, there isn't any. All right, so no danger to the heart, and therefore uh, PNES are not lethal. Okay, if you're able to avoid physical injuries, all right, from falling down, breaking your leg, if we can avoid that, uh, then then there is usually not lethal. All right, so so no, knowing that, I think uh, just it will, will will hopefully resolve uh, some of the anxiety. But, but although not damaging, you know, we, we understand that this cause, uh, you know, that, that these still cause a lot of suffering and a lot of uh, hardships in your life. And, 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 a, and a lot of, another part that a lot of patients tell me is that they feel like people just don't understand, that they're kind of in this alone, right? Mm -hmm. That people, uh, because they're not going through this, they don't quite understand uh, what they're going through. And so the second part of our diagnosis is to relate that, that we understand, right, that, that we are with you here. That, uh, that we know we know that there is no silver bullet or magic pill right or, or any one procedure I can do tomorrow and get you better the next day all right we, we understand that and and we know that uh, that it creates a lot of hardships it can be just as disabling as epilepsy okay. in fact uh, it could some some could be even more disabling than epilepsy all right and and that we know that it is not the patient's fault okay uh, you know, when they're, they're, it's not from craziness or acting out, it's not pseudo-seizure or fake seizure, okay? It's not just in your head. And we, it's, these, these are well-studied phenomenon, and they're very real. If it's right. not in your head, yeah. then couldn't there be a better term for it than psycho? Because everybody That's right. says psycho, that means right. it's in your head. Right. Psychological. Right, right. right. And, and you know how... And that, all, that already makes a person right. feel bad. That's right. And, you know, and, yeah, uh, I, mean, I hear about that a lot, right? So, and so, so, so that, that's why some people often just like to use the word non-epileptic seizure and kind of yeah, remove that second. Just say non-epileptic seizure yeah. instead of psycho. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. very mm -hmm. derogatory in okay. my mind. It just that's a put down to okay. the person. But, but remember, uh, but from the, uh, but, but from the, the, the doctor's perspective, though, yeah, you know, a, a lot know. of psychological just, problems have have biological basis too. Right. right? I mean, when people are depressed, right, right? That's because of chemical imbalance, right? right. Biological chemical imbalance right. in your brain that may cause you to be depressed. All right. right. So, so that that boundary between what is what is psychological and what is biological, I mean, I think it's very blurred. I mean, I understand. Right. I understand. You, understand that, right? you know, but right. a lot of people wouldn't. Yeah. You know. That's right. And so, yeah, so increasingly, yeah, we're, we're trying to... I mean, that of, makes a stressor in itself. <laughs> that's right. People to, not, to get that diagnosis. Yeah, and, and so people not understand you, right? They feel like right, you're right, alone. Right. Yeah, and that's, yeah. why, that's why this part two of the, of the diagnosis oh, explanation. Okay. We, we often emphasize that a lot. All right, thank you. And, uh, and because, uh, because there's no one single factor, right? You know, the, the, the example with the kettle, right? I miss so many. Because there's not one single trigger or stressor that, that creates these attacks, um, the journey is going to be long. Right? You know, it's going to take time to, to gradually help uh, reduce or, or mitigate uh, each of these factors. All right? but, but there is hope, all right? because, and I've seen that. Right? By, by promoting and trying to create a proper environment of healing, okay? I've, I've seen how, uh, how the, the software problem right, that's behind this, how that can ease up over time. Assuming that, that the proper environment right, is provided and created, okay? All right, so, so, so now, now the next question, of course, is going to be, well, what's the environment, right? Mm -hmm. Well, how do we create that kind of environment, okay?
But but first, we have to work as a team, right? The doctors understands we're, you're not alone in this. You may feel that you're alone, all right? But the doctors, we understand your hardships, and we have to work together to conquer this beast. We cannot let it conquer us. Okay, all right. And so, uh, so so yeah. So so by environment, right? By the proper environment, what what do you think I, I mean by that? Right? And I'll, I'll go through that next. What are some of the proper environment that we try to create or engender so that we can allow for that? Uh, proper sleep. Pro proper sleep. Proper very nutrition. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Stress. Okay. Stress. Okay. Kind of relaxation, like nice music. Okay. You know, meditation, yoga, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, my daughter. <coughs> It's routine. It just, it's just being a routine. It's when they're doing star testing at school and her whole schedule gets messed up is when we start to notice things like this. Okay, okay. so but, but having at least more of a, a routine, right? Okay, and, and so so maybe maybe if there were a test that's coming up, perhaps have, have her study ahead of time so she doesn't have to break her routine. That, that could be Well, with her, it's more possible. just a, a disruption in her normal day. In her normal day, okay. Mm -hmm. She's very OCD, so. Okay. <laughs> very. Okay, anybody else have, have other suggestions for creating that proper environment? Surround yourself around positive people. Yeah. That's very good. That's right. Uh, positive. <coughs> mind. Looking at a class is half full, right, rather than, rather than half empty. Okay. So, uh, so, so, yes, for some patients, not all, all right, uh, there, there, are, uh, very, there are known triggers that can uh, uh, kind of lead to an attack. And, and by, by tuning your radar, right, by making your radar more sensitive to these triggers, then maybe you can help identify, you can identify it and perhaps work on avoiding it or, or reducing it or mitigating it. Okay. And, 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 what are, and what are possible triggers that, that you guys uh, have, uh, have heard about for, uh, for, for psychogenic seizures or non epileptic seizure? Sleep deprivation. Okay, all right, yeah, that's one for sure. Is, is flash when, you, when you sleep deprived, you're often more irritated, right? Your brain are, is more irritable. Are those flashing lights one for non-epileptic or those for... They, they can, they can they be for can both. Be I've seen how flashing lights can trigger both. Okay, all right, all right. So, so these are all very good examples of physical triggers, right? What we call physical triggers. Um, something that is an environment that can, uh, that can trigger it, right? But then that we, that, let's not forget about interpersonal triggers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, arguments with people. Arguments between people, mm -hmm. right? Conflicts. Mm -hmm. All right. Those, those are, are, are well known triggers. In grief. Grief. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. So, so that. So, the, so then, what she's going to is intrapersonal triggers. Yeah. All right. Intrapersonal trigger meaning, meaning my own grief, right? Uh, or, or or my own, my own sense of perfectionist, mm -hmm. perfectionism, and mm -hmm. how I'm not able to achieve that. That, that distress or conflict yeah, inside. So your self-esteem. Self-esteem, right. Injury of my self-esteem. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. And so, so you see that, and sometimes people, unless they, they're taught about it, they, they can they don't seem to, they can't really see it because their radar is not tuned to it, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's why, uh, that's why, that's the role of the counselor, is to help us identify some of the triggers that may be invisible to us. Right, and then right. we can better become more tuned to it. All right, so, so there are both physical triggers. That, that's more easy. We kind of all know that, right? But then there are intrapersonal, and then there are interpersonal uh, triggers. And, 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 then, and then by, by finding, by kind of learning that, then, then we, uh, we kind of find ways to avoid or minimize the triggers. Okay, and, and any questions? <coughs> that's one important way uh, to gain control over the psychogenic seizures and, and, and promote that, that, that environment of healing. Okay. Another important one uh, are warnings. Uh, do, you, do you guys hear about that? Sometimes we, people have, have auras. auras or warnings right before your attack. Do a lot of people okay. have them? So, uh, I, I believe a lot of people do. Okay. Uh, yeah. Not all, but I do a lot of people with, with both epileptic seizure um, or psychogenic seizure. Is I think that both warmth have. and numbness? Is that, part, is that part of the aura? For some patients, they may. For some patients. Is there, is there a propensity for higher? with one or the other, or is it pretty even split? Probably pretty even split. I, I've seen just as many patients with non epileptic seizure having warnings as those that without, all right. as those with epileptic seizure, all right. But, but imagine if you do, are able to get your warning, right, or to know what it is, right, there, there's something you can do about it, 
right? When you have that warning. Okay, what, what are some things that you can actually do uh, or, or tell yourself or, or kind of work with yourself? Try to relax. Yeah. Try to relax, right? Well, yourself out of situation. Or walk away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or walk away. <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. That's right. And, and sometimes, uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, it may, not, it may not be you that notice your warning, but your family that notice your warning. Okay, they may see a certain look on your face, even though you're not aware of that. But, but they can help you with that too. So, so ask your friends, talk to your family, and and, uh, and then keep. Uh, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, you, you may not notice it until you write it down, right? because you know, if you have your events once a month, you're gonna forget, right? So, so if you keep a log, right? Every time you have your symptoms, when you have your seizure, you write down the war any warning, right? Write it down, what actually happened, how long it occurred. And keep that, keep that somewhere safe, right? And next time you have it a month later, you do, you know, go, go down the same form. And after a few months, right, look for a pattern, right? And then, it's, and then when, you, when you actually go back and look at that pattern, that's when you notice, yeah, actually, I do have that warning from time to time. Huh? And, and that's, um, that, that's how you can find it. What if you only get the warnings and you don't get the attacks? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, that, that happened to, to some people too. All right. Uh, but, but inevitably, some, you know, every, maybe most of the time they don't, but every now and then they, they usually do get an actual attack, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, am I not remembering right? Didn't it say that you most of the time wouldn't remember having these? Mm hmm. But, that, that's so right. It, that's if right. You're by yourself, now, then you have one. You're not necessarily. That, that, that's right. That's right. The part they may remember is when the, sh the seizure or the shaking actually start. Right? Oh. But the warning or the earlier parts, you know, they, that there's a better chance of remembering that part, the warning part. Oh. But the actual event um, itself, uh, that, that can yeah, that can be lost to memory. I I've been told that I have these kind of seizures. Oh, okay. And I I'm always alert whenever I have whenever them. You have them. Okay, and, and so so first first thing first is to get get yourself to a safe position, right? When you have that safe warning, position. a safe exactly. position, exactly. Right, right. Because um, because remember remember my earlier slide, right? Uh, the chance of any major brain injury or heart injury is, is very very minimal, right? The main injury comes from physical injuries, from accidents mm -hmm. that occur when you have the non epileptic seizure. Therefore, getting you getting yourself to a safe position that will definitely avoid that. And then once you're in that safe position, then chances of any major catastrophic problem uh, would be very, very unlikely. Okay, so, so get, get yourself into a, a safe position. And, uh, for example, like lay on a sofa, right, or, or kneel and sit down. Okay, and then, um, and then the relaxation technique. I, I, I heard that mentioned, right? So, uh, so, so anybody want to tell me about what, what your techniques are? And, and perhaps we can... We can uh, Share, uh, well, share what, what works and what not works. I used to work um, as an EEG technician okay. and also as biofeedback therapist. That's and right. one of the things, two of the things that we did was we had our, our patients do muscle tension, purposeful muscle tension okay. and relaxation. Okay. So that you okay. like tense all the muscles in your face in right. your face and then relax. Tense right. all of them in your shoulders, your arms, and then and, relax. And you can see the EG changes and, from that. Right. right, and you can work on down your body and do that. Another thing is listening to some um, tapes that okay. are very soothing, okay. you know, okay. tapes. That's right, um, that's right. And, and as you relax, you know, mm -hmm. you can see the actual brain waves yeah, change. change. Yeah, change, right. yeah. It's, 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 uh, you know, it's, it's it's, it's hard to imagine how, how powerful your mind is. Oh yeah, um, it's very um, You know, when you're, you, you can see how the brain waves change as you become excited. Mm -hmm. You can see how it kind of calms down yeah. as you relax. Right. Right. So, so, so your, so, so your brain state does change depending mm -hmm. on how, how you feel. And those things and, are and helpful. And, we, and we've seen that. And that's helpful for things like uh, migraine headaches mm -hmm. and things like that too. Okay. Anybody else have any suggestion on, on relaxation yoga. techniques? Yoga. 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 <clears throat> You know, when, when I emphasize uh, slow, deep breathing, I, well, have, yeah, that too. I ask my patient to put, put, uh, put, put both hands, uh, one, one hand's on your chest, and another hand on your abdomen. Mm -hmm. and, and when you breathe, yeah. I want you to feel the breathing yeah. moving through your diaphragm. Yeah, that's another thing we do. So, so you can't just, it can't just be your chest moving, because otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, that, that creates very shallow yeah, breath. Breathing, right? yeah. But you need deep breathing, you need your abdomen to actually move. Yeah. 
and that will create more of a deep, soothing breathe. Yeah, that's right. Breath, exactly. okay. and, and, you, and you breathe in over three seconds, mm -hmm. hold it for two, and right? Then and then breathe out over three seconds. Mm -hmm. All right, that's, mm -hmm. that's what I meant by, the, by, by slow breathing technique. Slow breathing. Because what happens with a lot of psychogenic seizures is that people go into a hyperventilation state. Right? They're kind of breathing really fast and shallow, and so by by working constantly on that slow breathing, that's a, you know that's a really good a way to abort and, and kind of limit uh, the, the the seizure. And and then the, and then I think self dialogue, right? I think thoughts, you know, how, how how you what you think affects how you feel, how you feel will have, like how you act, yeah. right? And, and so 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 yeah, what, what kind of self thought or self dialogue uh, do, you, do you should you tell yourself when you have that warning? Yeah. Or as you're going through that breathing technique. Or, yeah, or what, or do, like, what do you tell yourself? Yeah, and I mean, like if you, in, during the day, if you find yourself yeah. saying, oh, you stupid idiot, you know, or something like that. That's right. No, don't do that. Go and do affirmations. Mm -hmm. I'm a brilliant, excellent person, or whatever That's you right. say. You know? That's right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? What, what kind of self dialogue uh, would, 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 you, uh, would, would you want to go through, or would you tell yourself uh, to, to, uh, to kind of help abort that, that warning? Prayer would do. A prayer would do. A, a prayer. Yeah, a lot of people do prayers. A lot of people do prayer. That's yeah. right, and, and that and that does work. I mean, I've, I've had actual cases of that. So, so, so first thing first is that uh, is that you, you reassure yourself that Doctor So and So right says that there are no brainstorm that's going on right now in my head. All right, so I'm going to be okay. Right, this is well, you know, this is well studied, and I'm going to be okay. This won't cause brain damage. Another another important thought. Right, that a lot of patients tell me that is helpful is to kind of tell themselves that this is not something to be ashamed about. All right, this is really more of a message from my body telling me that my stress is up to here. Right, it's just a message. Right, right. right. And, and uh, I got to work on getting that message down. Right, and that, that's all that is. Right, it's not to be ashamed or, or no one. There's no one to blame. Not me. Not others. Right, it's just a body's message telling me that I got to take care of something. It's, and so, so when you when you kind of reassure yourself that way, you know, then then hopefully that kind of ends that vicious cycle, right? kind of, and and then and then the, for for some patients uh, that that tend to uh, that tend to tend to abort the uh, the symptoms. Now, now it takes practice, though. I promise. I mean, when you do that first time, it's not going to work. But like with like with tennis, right? The more you do it, yeah, right, the, sure. the better yeah. better you get. Right? Better you get. Okay. And then to, and then I think one of you mentioned about about that. Uh, that visualization, right, uh, toward uh, for uh, to uh, to a safe place or a favorite place, right? What, which one do you visualize? What, what do you visualize? What, what do you mention about uh, having a vacation spot? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, you go to the mountains in Colorado, okay. looking out over the expanse of beautiful mm -hmm. um, horizon. Whatever. Okay, all right. And and when you visualize, uh, you know, I mean, it's good to have a picture, right, mm -hmm. uh, in, in your pocket or, or on your phone. Uh, but when you visualize it, uh, you know you're, you're not just looking at it. I mean, you're you're really you're, I mean, you're really there. You can you can remember the how the breeze yeah, feel that day. Yeah, the smell right? of the smell of, of the vacation spot, right? Often the if pine it's a, trees. If it's, a, if it's a forest, if it's often a pine tree, right? That you can remember, right? Yeah. There's a smell of, uh, of maybe some of the woodpeckers on, on the, uh, mm -hmm. the forest. The sound of the birds. Some yeah. of the birds, right? Uh, the feeling of, of the breeze, uh -huh. right? The sound of the river. The sound of the river that could, that could, that could be running through that, uh, that forest. So you're not just looking at it, but you're trying to relive uh, all that senses, mm -hmm. right? And then, and then, um, and then, and so you're uh, so you're actually there in person, uh, and it gets easier and easier the more you practice that, all right? And I know I know it may seem kind of um, kind of idealistic, right? But it actually really does work from uh, from my own experience, mm -hmm. right? I've had. Um, I would say out of out of ten patients that I mentioned about trying that, at least half of them have told me have come back and told me that uh, mm -hmm. that doctor that that tip that you mentioned about the relaxation technique and and the, and the, and the imagery exercise yeah, you know, that, 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 Charles that, that really Charles does work. So so I can you know I can verify based on my experience mm -hmm. that, that I've seen that uh, work and, and and but and but for almost all of them. It's, it takes about, it's not just the first or few times. Oh, no, right? it takes several times. And, 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 and so it requires persistence, not giving up. But with time, eventually, and sometimes even months after, then it starts to, uh, to get better. And they get, and they get so good at it that you don't even need a picture anymore or your mm -hmm. phone, right? You just yeah. kind of sit there and it, it all kind of, yeah. uh, it all kind of, kind of goes through uh, the, the image is created on its own. Yeah, you close your eyes, you can see it in your head. 
All right, and so so as I as I mentioned, uh, with practice, uh, uh, you can uh, you know, it can become perfect, and and, uh, and goal it is to eventually become uh, less bothered and be and be less fearful of these attacks. And and uh, and like I mentioned, others have achieved this goal, and and and, and have confidence that uh, you know that friends that you know or yourself. Uh, can can do it as well, all right. And and, and so these are examples that, that I have, right? These are patients that I have. Uh, yeah. Is it possible to overcome these? I mean, do you do you, does it ever happen with a patient that just they mm -hmm. realize, oh, you're laid off, this is how, I mean, and they don't have any, any again. I mean, is mm -hmm. that is that realistic or is that uh, yes, yes, it, I've, I've seen that occur too. Okay. Right? I mean, um, I, I've, and then uh, often it requires some kind of therapy or right. you know or, or process. Right? Okay. Usually doesn't get better on his own. Okay, we have to realize that. But with, with proper motivation and, and proper chemistry with your therapist all the time, it, it can get better. Right. The goal is not I, to I, get rid of well, I mean, the ideally you want to get rid, but the yeah. goal is to reduce it and be able to control it better, and then the hopes that it will. That, that, that's right. Actually, that's a very good point. In fact, you, you kind of read my mind. Your the, these examples that I have will kind of illustrate that. Right. I have, I have uh, TJ is one of my uh, more. Uh, you know, more long-standing patient, right? Uh, he uh, he's able to accomplish goal of fishing. Uh, sorry, she she's able to uh, uh, finish uh, her nursing school, um, and uh, with the help of her doctor, uh, she educated her classmates and teachers regarding her attacks, uh, and thus was able to reduce the tension in the classroom. All right, and, and to her, she felt that that was a tremendous success. She's able to kind of go to classes now without the fear and without the stigma. And complete her degree. All right. Another patient, AK, uh, uh, undertook uh, successfully undertook safety measures whenever he experienced warning attacks. All right. He would uh, he would find a, a safe place, and for two years uh, he did not experience uh, any major injuries and did not have to go to the ER at all for his attacks. All right. And, and saves him uh, a lot of money at the same time. All right. A lot of co -pays. DR. Okay. He made efforts uh, to take 30 minute power nap each day. After lunch, all right. So he would take a uh, nap from one to, to one twenty every day, uh, and after about a month, uh, uh, well, you know that the nap helped him feel more rejuvenated and relaxed afterwards. And after about a month, uh, he noticed that his tax are reduced by about half. All right. So it's so just a simple, simple task alone. You know, the, the, the environment, right? It's creating the proper environment with just one measure, right? Taking the, the power nap, uh, that alone was able to reduce the tax by about half. And notice that among these three examples, right, all of them still have attacks. None of them are, are seizure free. But yet, to them, right, they feel like they have made substantial improvement to their lifestyle, to their quality of life. And, and to them, and to me, that, that's improvement. Right? Where something is, something is if uh, we made a change, we made the change toward, toward the better right, for these patients. Okay, so, so it may not have to be, you know, seizure freedom may not be the ultimate goal. Goal is to regain more functionality, right? more independence. Okay. Doctor, what type of anti-seizure medication do you find most effective for for, for, your for, for these for these patients? Okay, for for these patients, you mean you mean medications that may help? Right. right. For many, for these patients, a lot of them uh, will have concurrent depression, right, or anxiety. So in addition to counseling, there are some medications that can help stabilize your mood, right, will help reduce anxiety. And I think having that together with the counseling, I think together that combination uh, can, can help a lot. So the patients are not actually uh, taking or prescribed anti-seizure medications? Right, because anti-seizure medications are meant for brainstorms, right? right? They're okay. meant for brainstorms, and these patients, fortunately, do not have that. Now, now some, some anti-seizure medications can also help stabilize people's mood. They also have that added benefit. So, so, so they may still be on an anti-seizure medication for that benefit, right? Not for the brainstorms, okay. but for the mood stabilizing benefit. All right, all right, okay. But the mood stabilizing uh, medication, isn't that usually addictive? Uh, not, not particularly. I think we have some that, that work very well and very safe or very stable for long long run. Some are, I think. I think you're some maybe, but there are others now that are very safe for for long term use. You have to talk to your doctor about that, all right, to make sure that we pick the one that is uh, the safest to uh, to to use. Okay. okay. 
and, and similar to what was mentioned earlier, you know, about your daughter having OCD-ness, right? Uh, I think this this uh, strive for perfectionism is something that is very, very prevalent that occurs in, in, in a lot of our patients, okay? And and we, we are our own self-critic, I and mean, we are our own worst critic. Even though other people may say it's okay, uh, when, when, we, when we're not achieving what we want to achieve or something's not right, right, um, you know, you know we often the, we become, you know, these type of patients become very distraught um, and, and they, 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 they're very hard on themselves and they blame themselves and, and then and the next thing happens, this thing you know, it, it's a seizure occur. Okay, so, so, so I like to uh, sort of tell my patients uh, that, that we, we have to, uh, you know, we have to give ourselves a break. We have to be our own best friend, and and, and this serenity prayer is what uh, let's, let's you know have you seen this before? They they sort oh, yeah. of they sort of uh, use this prayer in a in, in alcoholic anonymous meetings, right? But it's about uh, granting you the serenity to accept the things uh, that that I cannot change or that we cannot change, right? Uh, but the courage to change the things that we can or I can, and then the wisdom to know the difference, to know what I can change and what I can. Hopefully, by by seeing, by really buying into this, all right, maybe we can disrupt that that uh, that maladaptive perfectionism, you know, that, that we often, mm -hmm. you know, we yeah. often have, and, which often is a source of, of the problem. Mm -hmm. Being too critical and not not accepting enough of yourself, because the, the greatest the greatest success is successful self acceptance, and that sometimes uh, what matters the most is how you how you see yourself in the mirror. By seeing the glass as half full uh, rather than half empty. All right, and and um, and then the, um, another part. I think this was mentioned earlier. Right? This was mentioned earlier is, is how how to create that proper environment. Right. One my, one person already mentioned about um, about taking taking eating the same meal every day. Right. Or, or, or speaking the same amount of time every day. Right. So that's that's one the, one way of creating the right environment. Uh, having a relaxing ritual prior to your bedtime. Uh, keeping your bedroom dark, cool, and comfortable. Avoiding caffeine within six hours, uh, uh, or, or avoiding alcohol or smoking within two hours of bedtime. All right. Avoiding eating naps. All right. You, you can have a new nap, but try to avoid uh, evening nap uh, right before you go to bed. Uh, and then, if you don't fall asleep within 15 minutes of uh, you know of, of uh, going to bed, uh, then, then then get out of bed. Right. That's not. You know that that's not um, you know and go and do other things okay because we have to train our body right that when you do go to bed you know you're there to sleep if you're there and then you're you know if you're reading in TV, if, you, if you're reading or watching TV in bed then you're kind of training your body to be awake and doing other things when you're in bed all right so mm -hmm. so so uh, so uh, so don't 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 stay in your bed too long um, and, you know when you're not sleeping if you're doing other things try to do it el elsewhere could I have something about um I had heard, read somewhere, that the light that is on our cell phones and the light from the TV, we should avoid for at least four hours before going to sleep, okay. because that signals your brain that it's dawn and it's time That's to wake right. up. That's right. Is that true? That, yes, that is very true. <laughs> and, and, um, okay. Uh, yeah, and that's the reason why we wouldn't want to watch TV, right, because again, you're your brain, you know, the lights on the TV is telling your brain that to wake, you know, up. To wake up, right? That you got to process, you know, these conditions right. on TV and that you're so not ready to sleep yet. So it'd be that better four hours before we plan on going to sleep to turn off the TV and read a book or something. That's right. Okay. Right, right. You read a book, but, but not in bed, though. Not in bed. You read a bed yeah. uh, in your desk. Okay. okay. All right. And, and why, why, why do we got to do all this? Because getting good sleep is critical, right? Yeah. If, you, if you sleep well, you perform 20% better, right? This okay. is what this what's this, uh, you know, this is a mattress ad, right? So, right. so I can't, uh, I, I don't know what data this is from, but it sounds good. It sounds good. I, I believe it's true. Probably true. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> okay, and, and then, the, and then the, we have to exercise regularly, right? Because what happens when you exercise? Happy hormones, hormones are released, right? Endorphins are released. Okay. The 20 naps that I mentioned, you know, it's, it's brief, right? It doesn't take up a lot of time. Okay, it can be easily done, and uh, and it, it causes uh, there, there's a lot of a lot of benefit uh, that I've seen from boosting memory, including cognitive skills, and having more creativity or energy level at work. 
more. And then, and then I think this was mentioned earlier about not missing meals, right? Because hunger creates kind of creates kind of creates an irritability in your brain, right? When you're low on sugar, and, and then to have a uh, to develop a good system, a support system, because friends, uh, you know, friends are, are good medicine. Right? That's uh, that's well known, and, and that's why you have to be your own best friend too, right? because because. Uh, because, because having having that good friendship, uh, because we're all social animals, right? We have to have others that accept us, and we have to accept ourselves. All right, and then the the, the, the neurologist, uh, the, the primary job of the neurologist is to make the or the epipathologist, right? Is to make the diagnosis, right? Um, to, to 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 monitor the safe withdrawal of your medication, right? Because again, there's always a chance of a mix disorder, as I mentioned, right? So. So we want what? mix disorder, that having both epilepsy and psychogenic seizure, Oh, mixed mix disorder. Mix disorder, yeah. And so when a neurologist withdraw your medicine, right, it's always good to have them still monitor. Right. Because how, how do you know, well, 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 maybe, you know, maybe you, you know, that the patient may have true epilepsy, epilepsy seizure that, that emerge, yeah. you know, as the medications are, are withdrawn. And, um, and, and the neurologist is there also uh, to, to answer questions and concerns, but eventually, uh, there, there uh, will be a transition, right, to the psychiatrist or psychologist who can then uh, help manage the patient. All right, the psychiatrist uh, is there uh, to help with the medication management, like anti anti anxiety medicines or mood stabilizing medicines, and the psychologist is there to provide the counsel uh, to help kind of identify the invisible triggers that a person may have, and to further educate about about uh, other measures. Uh, that, that you can take right, you know, All right, so that's the typical a way that, that the patients are transitioned from team to team. And how long do you think that transition happens? We, we get a lot of, yeah. I say, some calls at the foundation saying, yeah. um, my neurologist says I have non-epileptic seizures and he's dropped me, mm. they've dropped me. Yeah. You know? And so how long should that transition take? And right, right, I, I would say that, um, I would say at, at least a few months, three to six months, I think it's a good it's a good window, and and uh, and again, some patients um, may, may not be quite as ready to uh, to to see to to accept and, and see a psychologist yet. Again, the, the stigma in our society is very strong in some culture, especially. And and, and it's okay. We can we can wait. You know, we can wait. Allow patient the time to, to to digest, process, and maybe eventually they, they will come will come around. And and so 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 if you're not quite ready to see the psychiatrist, uh, then the neurologist. Uh, Need to be involved. All right. And are they transitioning to a neuropsychologist or just a regular psychiatrist? I, I think um, I, I think either one is okay. okay. Um, there, there are many many psychiatrists mm -hmm. who are comfortable. Um, of course, neuropsychologists uh, or neuropsychiatrists. You know, this is their bread and butter. All right, so that's always preferable. But but there are plenty of uh, kind of you know plenty of psychiatrists, psychologists that, that will uh, be able to work with patients uh, in psychogenic seizure. The typical therapy that they go through is what we call cognitive behavior therapy, mm -hmm. or CBT, and uh, that's a term that, that you'll hear uh, that, that the patient go through. Okay. Okay. All right. And so. Uh, um, there's a lot of talk about the use of, um, of, of dogs. I know we have, there's a seizure dogs. The dogs are trained to detect. Mm -hmm. You know, how to dogs to detect seizures. Yes. But I know too that there are, there's a lot of and a, a utilization of dogs to work with um, veterans with um, post-traumatic post stress. That, that's right. Is this is this an area that you think that that? I, I would I would imagine so. I mean I mean I mean I, I have a dog and and, and, and the, your dogs are very in tune to your emotions. I've noticed that right. As yeah. soon as the moment that I'm like a little bit snappy, kind of gets in line. Yeah. <laughs> so 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 I'm sh you know your your dogs. I'm sure may, may sense some change in your behavior. The, the warning, right? The warning that you may not know that your uh, their family or dog may know, and, and I think in those situations... And they can know, also have a calming, you know, calming and, and, and right. a calming effect. And, yeah, well. they give you a lot of unconditional love and affection mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. helps you to relax. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. So we, we, have a, we have a program at the VA that we have we can have service dog uh, for, mm -hmm. for patients with epileptic seizure um, and, uh, and non-epileptic seizure as well. So, the, so, the, so you have dogs? Right, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. yes, we do We do have a program like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, all right. Where 
do you have opportunities for the family to come in to educate them on non-epileptic seizures? Because we find that a lot too, that the families are just not accepting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this diagnosis. It has to be epilepsy. Okay. Well, well you, you notice that, uh, that a lot of the slides that I give are actually kind of meant as if you have psychogenic seizure, right? Now, right. I know a lot of you are, are family, but, but these are the slides that we actually give uh, in our support group at the VA. Okay, these are the slides that I give to patients. Or, or my NP, I have a nurse practitioner, and, and we have um, a epilepsy and epilepsy support group and a psychogenic seizure support group. And this one, the, these are the slides uh, that are meant for that support group. Okay. That's awesome. Okay. It's, um, it's once a month, um, and then, then every, and then the, every month, uh, you know, new, main, new members come and then others go. Like I say, once they feel like they've kind of understand enough, you know, so, so there's a, a new, new group each, each month. What, um, how, where does partial seizures, where does that fall? Partial, do they fall? That, that, fall, that falls under epileptic seizure. That's category. epileptic, epileptic right. not the, the psycho. Right, right. And, and what that means is that you have, um, you know, you have a brainstorm that comes from one part of the brain, right? So a partial part of the brain from one section uh -huh. that then kind of spread and, uh -huh. and, and can then generalize, all right? Okay. Versus grandmas or, or, or generalized seizures are, are spring storms that kind of start from, from a big area of your brain. Okay, not, so the, not one single part. So the fact that there is a storm but in a specific, in a specific area part, and, that rule, the, and that then rules out the, the yes. PNE? Yes, PNES. That rules that out. That will rule that out. On, so, on EEG, we, we, we can see the difference. We can see what a partial seizure looks like uh, and, and, and uh, diagnose it. Oh, okay. Okay, well, well, well very, very good. And, you know, these are all very good questions, and I, and I really enjoyed the, you know, the, 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 the feedback and the, and the responses. Okay, so, sounds good? Yes. All right, all right, thank, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Foundation really appreciates you okay. coming out, and so we have a little token oh, oh, of okay. appreciation right. for you for coming out. Um, so please, thank you. Okay. Right. Everyone that's here now, um, you know we do. We have here.